Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the 40th annual MSK Alumni Society meeting. We're so glad you took the time out of your schedules to come. It's really a really exciting program. I say so myself, um, but only because the people I invited all said yes, and it's just a wonderful group of speakers. So I'm really excited about today, and I'm excited about all the things I'm going to learn tomorrow for those of you that are interested in saying, staying for tomorrow's um, pathology portion of the, of the conference. Um, so the talks are scheduled to be about 15 minutes and uh, followed by a time for questions and answers. Um, if you do have questions for the speakers, we'll probably take most of them at the end. There are microphones um, to use, and if you'll try to use the microphones even in this relatively intimate space, it helps with um, the recording of the conference um, so that uh, people, when they are watching this online, are able to hear the questions um, and the responses from the speakers. The speakers will come to the podium and give their talks and then are okay to return to the um, seats in the audience, and then we'll have all the speakers come up at the end um, of the group of talks to take questions as a group. A, a few other housekeeping announcements. Um, Dr. Bell McGuinn was not able to make it today, um, and so Dr. Jason Connor will be giving um, a, the talk about PARP inhibition, and um, Dr. Grisham is um, happily home with twins. We're so excited for her. And uh, Dr. Agajanian, who's supposed to be honored, has agreed to give her talk, so Carol is working extra, extra hard, but it is actually, um, just like Carol, to take um, both that leadership and generosity route uh, to cover for, um, for Rachel today. Um, so I think that's kind of uh, the housekeeping part. I'm Marty Hensley, and uh, it's been really my privilege to serve as president of this um, alumni society for this year, and, um, and really a privilege to work with the alumni society um, group, um, particularly Keith Yearwood and Jennifer Cruz to help organize this conference. So I hope it'll be a great day. And with that, I'll introduce um, our first speaker. The font on this is so small that I get to wear my glasses all all day, uh, Mark Robson will be starting things off. The group of talks is Applying Advanced Genetic Testing to Gynecologic Malignancies. Mark Robson from the Department of Medicine, thanks for t starting the day off for us. Thank you. It's a good thing I'm an early riser because genetics always goes first. Um, so what we're going to talk a little bit about today is, is some new stuff with regard to ovarian cancer predisposition, so-called moderate penetrance predisposition. Um, this is coming up increasingly in a, a world of new genetic testing, and uh, what I'm going to try to do is propose an approach to this, which we have hammered out in conjunction with the, um, with the GYN DMT, so a um, little bit new stuff. We've learned a lot over the last 20 or 30 years about the genetic architecture of breast cancer risk or ovarian cancer risk and cancer risk in general. Sorry, I'm a breast oncologist, so every now and then the breast slips in. Um, there is a lot, there are a lot of so-called common variants in the general population which are not in and of themselves functionally deleterious but have minor effects individually on risk. But when they aggregate, they probably are responsible for most of the hereditable variation. Uh, we don't test for them because individually, each of these changes really has a, a very trivial effect. But in the future, we may well be doing testing for multiple sites to characterize an individual's genetic background and generate a, a polygenic score, which helps us place them along a spectrum of risk within the sporadic population. But what we think most about when we think about cancer predisposition is over here, which are very uncommon mutations, but nonetheless, they have a very significant effect. Highly penetrant is the, is the term of art. So although they're rare, um, if you have one, it's pretty dramatic. And BRCA1, BRCA2 are obviously the most uh, well-known in that category. And then there's another, uh, perhaps more recently defined group of genes which, uh, when mutated, have a lower level of effect, so-called moderate penetrance genes. And there's no accepted threshold between moderate and high, so there's probably some bleed in here. It's a bit of a spectrum. 
Um, but these rare variants have been defined through candidate gene association studies rather than through family studies. Uh, and these are the ones that are coming out now and causing us perhaps a little bit more, um, uh, more aggravation in terms of clinical management. The high penetrance predispositions or, or the ovarian cancer predispositions that are linked to cancer family syndromes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, are well known. Um, just to kind of go back through the numbers, uh, these are data from a recent population-based ascertainment or almost population-based ascertainment in Israel uh, looking at the BRCA founder mutations. And for BRCA1, the ovarian cancer risk by the age of 70 was up to about 50 percent for BRCA2. It was considerably lower, about 13 percent. Most of the numbers have run in this range. If you extend the time frame out to age 80, um, you don't get as much variation for BRCA1. You get a huge jump, at least in this study, for BRCA2. But I think that that's probably just unstable estimates because of very small numbers of cases out in the older age group. So I think the general numbers that we quote to people are between 45 and 50 percent for ovarian cancer for BRCA1 and between 15 and 20 percent for BRCA2. Lynch syndrome, of course, is a colorectal cancer predisposition syndrome and also a uterine cancer predisposition syndrome in, in your neck of the woods, um, but it does have an associated ovarian cancer risk. The risk is probably around 8 to 10 percent by the age of 80. There does seem to be very, some variation uh, depending on what gene is mutated. MSH2 has pretty consistently been at the higher end of the risk. Um, and then depending on which study you look at, MLH1 or MSH6 come next. PMS2 risk seems to be quite variable, um, and right now there have been relatively few studies, but it, the studies that have been done ha have also shown risks in the 8 to 10 percent range by the age of 80. So even though these mutations are so-called high penetrance mutations, they're not particularly high penetrance for ovarian cancer. They are, of course, high penetrance for uterine cancer, which is um, not something that I'm going to, to really touch upon. Now, the moderate penetrance genes have largely been identified in the context of breast cancer predisposition, um, but many of these have been evaluated in families that came to clinics because of either family histories of breast or breast and ovarian cancer because they came in for BRCA evaluation. And so naturally, there's some sense of, well, could these also be ovarian cancer genes since they were identified in those clinical populations? We've known about these for a long time. Most of them have been uh, on the books since probably the early 2000s, although some are more recent. Um, but we haven't been routinely testing for them, largely because we haven't been certain about how to handle them from the clinical side. Uh, but with the recent advent of next generation sequencing and multi-gene panel testing, uh, this choice, to some extent, has been removed from us because now People come in, they have broad testing for uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, and all these genes at the same time, and we wind up having individuals presenting with mutations in so-called moderate penetrance genes uh, asking for advice, even in the absence of a very strong evidence base for us to guide them. And this is not an uncommon issue. This is uh, a compilation of multi-gene panel series looking at the absolute number of mutations. This is not a percentage. This is an absolute number of mutations that were identified in a group of individuals who underwent testing with either ovarian, fallopian tube, or primary peritoneal carcinoma. And just to kind of look real quickly, BRIP1 is, at least is the mode. It's the most commonly identified mutation. MSH6, which I told you before, um, is part of Lynch syndrome. CHECK2 and ATM are genes that are largely breast cancer predisposition genes, not really strongly associated with ovarian cancer, and this is kind of an illustration of the ascertainment problem. If you come in with a family that's called breast and ovarian cancer, then you may find these, even if they don't necessarily have anything to do with the ovarian cancer that occurred in Aunt Millie, RAD51C, and then a long tail of other stuff. A couple of points about this. First is that there's a fairly broad distribution of different genes, and the other is that they're not common. This is over 1,500 cases, and the most commonly identified mutation was in 22 individuals. So this isn't something that we find a lot, but when we do find it, we need to deal with it. There have been a number of case control studies trying to evaluate whether or not the associations that are observed in these clinical series are, if you will, real. Uh, the term of art for that is clinical validity. And so if you look at large population-based case control studies, largely, um, evaluating all the different genes, the three that come out are, are BRIP1, for which the relative risks are in the order of 8 to 10, with this one outlier uh, using a different analytic method, 
RAD 51C, which is a little bit lower, and RAD 51D, which is kind of variable. The confidence intervals on all these estimates are pretty wide because, as you saw from the clinical series, the numbers are low, but it gives you a general sense of what the relative risks are, and the confidence intervals don't span one, so these are pretty robust. There are associations, it's just the strength of those associations uh, may not be as great as for BRCA1 or BRCA2. The other genes have not been shown to be associated. And so as a matter of fact, if you kind of just tabulate it in terms of which ones are strongly or, or fairly definitively associated with ovarian cancer and which ones are not, ATM is not, CHECK2 is not. PALB2 is not, in, at least in a statistically significant way, although one case control study got a little bit close with p-value of 0.08. NBN is not, RIP1 is. RAD51CDR, RAD51B, not clear. The numbers are quite small, so I think the evidence is still out on that one. And BARD1 and MRE11, RAD50 are not, at least not so far. So this is the state of the art in 2015. The three that you need to worry about from a gynecologic oncology perspective are BRIP1, RAD51C, and D. So this is great. I've got case control studies and relative risk numbers and confidence intervals, but what does that mean for the person who comes in to see me in the clinic or see you in the clinic? Because this establishes the strength of the association, the validity of the association, but it gives us no insight into the fundamental question which you all need to deal with is, does this person need surgery, yes or no? And if so, when do you do the surgery? Because we're all very aware of the implications of premature menopause for women with BRCA mutations. Do these women need to have the same um, type of intervention? So what you can do is you can take relative risks, and by making some assumptions, you can actually calculate estimated lifetime risks and age-specific risks um, using a fairly straightforward life table type of formula. There's some assumptions that are based into this, that are baked into it. One of them is that the relative risk is constant over the lifetime. But if you have increased risks at younger ages, it doesn't really have that much effect because the baseline incidence is so low at younger ages that it doesn't really change anything or, or change much. And if you apply the relative risks from the case control studies to the non-Hispanic white um, age-specific incidence from the SEER data in the U.S., what you wind up with is these numbers down at the bottom for lifetime risks. So population is about 1.3% to the age of 80. Um, so BRIP1 goes up about 13%. RAD51D is about 14%. And RAD51C is around 65 to 7%. Confidence intervals on these are wide. And so if you take upper and lower limits, you can get numbers that range from quite low to quite high. But at least as a first approximation, it makes sense. And so these numbers, I think we have to make clinical decisions. Are these sufficient to justify prophylactic oophorectomy? Well, these are certainly in the same range as BRCA2. And so if we say it's okay for BRCA2, it should be okay for these. This is a little bit lower, um, but there's no a priori reason why this should be materially different from this, since it's essentially exactly the same pathway in a, in a neighboring gene. So I think it would be a little uncomfortable making genotype or, or at least gene-specific decisions. Um, and I think RAD51C probably should go in the same category as, yes, prophylactic oophorectomy is acceptable, probably warranted. The more difficult question is when. And so if you look at the age-specific risks, what happens here is the cumulative risk for these genes doesn't exceed population risk until really the mid-40s and doesn't exceed the risk that a first-degree relative of a sporadic ovarian cancer patient has until right around age 50. So one way of making a decision about when is the threshold for surgery is we don't routinely do surgery for people who have, or certainly not um, premenopausal surgery, for women whose only risk factor is having a first-degree relative affected with ovarian cancer. So why would you do it on, if the genetic risk is at that same level? So one proposal is, and it's just a proposal, is not to do surgery until the risk exceeds or approaches this level, which means that you wouldn't start talking about doing oophorectomy for these women until their mid-40s or until they approach the age of 50. Just for kind of sanity checking, would this work if we applied that same type of logic to BRCA1 and BRCA2? So these are age-specific risks um, using that exact same methodology 
uh, and some relative risk derived from an unselected case series or, or group of studies done by Antonis Antonou. And, the same, and what it works out is, yeah, for BRCA1, you, you kind of get close to the threshold of the first degree relative around 35 to 39, which is when we start really talking about oophorectomy for BRCA1. For BRCA2, you get up there around age 50, and I think many people really are reasonably comfortable, at least from the ovarian cancer risk prevention perspective, um, allowing BRCA2 carriers to go a little bit later and, and perhaps not have oophorectomy until the mid to late 40s, um, at least based on the ovarian cancer risk. So that same type of approach would at least get you in the ballpark of what we're doing for clinical um, recommendations for BRCA1 and BRCA2. Now, this is probably worth modifying in the presence of a family history. In the case control studies, there's an interesting observation is that if you look at the population-based case control, which is unselected, um, the age of onset for the ovarian cancers in these families was relatively low for most of them and the majority were over the age of 60. So very few cases and almost no cases actually diagnosed under the age of 40 and only 20 percent between 40 and 49. But there was also within the same study a, um, a ascertainment from a familial ovarian screening study in the UK. And in the setting where the risks were being determined in the setting of a familial ascertainment, there were more women with earlier onset ovarian cancer, which suggests that there are modifiers in the familial ascertainments which are pushing the risks younger and probably pushing the risks higher. Same thing happened with BRIP1. In the population-based ascertainment, nobody diagnosed under the age of 40. Only 3 percent of the cases diagnosed between 40 and 49. But in the familial ascertainment, very, very small numbers. There were significantly more cases diagnosed at early ages. So, summarize all of this, the cumulative risk exceeds the population cumulative lifetime risk at about age 40 for BRCA1, about age 50 for uh, RAD51, excuse me, BRIP1, and about age 50 for RAD51C. It gets over the first degree relative risk right around age 50 for BRIP1 and RAD51D and around age 60 for RAD51C, and it's probably shifted younger by a familial multiplier. So there are probably other variants that are present in the familial ascertainments that are increasing the risk due to the mutation. So in a way, you can conceptualize these moderate penetrance mutations as risk factors, and the risk factor aggregates with other risk factors to produce the woman's total lifetime risk. So unlike BRCA1 or BRCA2, where that mutation is what's causing the risk in a family, this is just an influence on the risk in the family in most of them. And those other factors may, in fact, be the common variants that I alluded to at the beginning. So we're probably not going to be far away from building models where we include common background variants and moderate penetrance variants to come up with a much more precise estimate of an individual's lifetime risk. So what do you think we should wind up doing? Um, this is aggregating both breast and ovarian cancer, just because it's hard to separate the two. Um, for the ones that are relevant to you, BRIP1, RAD51C, and RAD51D, breast cancer management should be dictated by the family history, uh, and you can use various family history models to determine whether or not MRI screening is probably warranted. Most of these are not clearly associated with breast cancer independently, and so just having a BRIP1 mutation shouldn't push somebody by itself into having um, MRIs, for instance. But you really do probably need to start thinking about doing oophorectomy some, or discussing oophorectomy in the late 40s. Um, and completion by age 50 probably makes sense, or around age 50 makes sense. Um, but er very early oophorectomy with potential induction of premature menopause doesn't seem to be warranted, absent a significant family history that magnifies the risk. For MMR genes, I mean, BRCA1, BRCA2, you know how to manage. For MMR genes, the age of onset or the timing of the surgery is generally dictated by the need for hysterectomy because the, ovarian, the uterine cancer risk is really much more um, driving the surgery in that setting and, of course, annual colonoscopy at age 25. Thank you very much. I think that was some kind of a quick path through it.